why did early modern theology students continue to produce handwritten notes after the arrival of the printing press? For the propedeutic arts faculty, young students meticulously copied notes from the professor's lecture in so-called collegia dictata, adorning them with colorful initials, illumination and uh, illuminations, and uh, as Huendolin has shown, engravings. Sometimes bound in precious leather, these codices were taken back, ho back home by the graduate and served as a memory and perhaps unofficial proof of study. These findings for the arts faculty perhaps skew the image of knowledge transfer at the higher faculties. Indeed, a first glance at the manuscripts produced by theology students upsets the traditional image of the Louvain student codex. No decoration, no initials, no, just plain text. The clearest expression of this bias is the use of the Dutch term collegia dictat. It kind of signals a practice of dictation as dominant in Leuven, although recent research into the arts faculty by Christophe, for example, has shown that classroom practices were more hybrid than that. Indeed, the use of the term collegia dictat has two implications for the way that we see the learning process of the student at the university. The first is that it suggests the student only took up a passive role in the process of knowledge transfer, that he was like a mere uh, scribe transcribing the spoken words of the professor. The second is that it centers the lecture and the lecture hall as a make, main locus of knowledge transmission. The danger of these two assumptions is that we would see these manuscripts merely as material remains of an oral auditive process of knowledge transmission happening and finishing in the lecture hall. In this presentation, I would like to center the materiality of one second order theology notebook from a book archeological perspective. After a brief introduction into the manuscript, I will delve into the codicological and textual aspects of the codex and identify our student and his reasons for the compiling his notes. These three steps will reveal the student's struggle in committing the lecture text to the handwritten medium. I will argue that the students for knowledge of his career shaped the materiality of his student notes. This will reevaluate these student notes as a side of knowledge production rather than merely of knowledge transmission. The manuscript in question is held at the University Library of Utrecht, manuscript 434. It consists of 537 folios and contains commentaries on the apostolic letters and the apocalypse mostly excerpted from the lectures of Michael Bayus, holder of the Royal Chair of Sacred Scripture between 1552 and 1589. Um, this chair had been established in 1546 by Emperor Charles V, and it would serve as the main teaching position for Bible studies at the Faculty of Theology in Leuven. Indeed, Bayus's classes were held every morning at 10 o'clock in the main auditorium located in the Cloth Hall in Leuven, and they were mandatory for theology students of all grades. From another set of student notes, um, those of the nephew of uh, Michael Bayus, it has become clear that uh, Bayus taught the entire New Testament in the order prescribed by the Vulgate in cycles of around four and a half years. The student who compiled this manuscript, 434, identifies himself as Johannes Lumelensis, member of the Dominican order in a series of colophons scattered throughout the manuscript. Uh, so Johannes Lumelensis had 530 folios, 37 rather, folios bound together into a codex, interleaving full bifolia um, with half folios. Each full folio containing the exegesis is alternated with a half folio containing references to the church fathers. Starting each biblical book on a new page, he has written them down more or less in the order for prescribed by the Vulgate, which is not surprising considering this is the order that Michael Weiss taught them as well. However, the dates um, scattered in these colophons do not seem to keep a chronological order. So how and when did our student produce his manuscript? Um, if we identify all of the watermarks uh, found in the 33 gatherings or bundles of bifolio that make up the manuscript, there's a great diversity uh, of watermarks to be found even within one gathering and even between the full and the half folios, which you can see 
with the letter S here. This signals that our students took new bundles of paper on several, several occasions. And you know, his unbound student notes were produced over a long, prolonged period of times. These are three of the, the watermarks that I've found. Um, and then setting out the choir structure of the codex against the division of the text according to the biblical books reveals an interesting strategy of the student in producing uh, so-called codicological blocks. Our student clearly attempted to finish the commentary of each book at the end of a gathering. Indeed, at multiple points in the manuscript, he reduced the amount of bifolia in the final gathering of a, um, of a biblical book. Um, producing these codicologically uh, linked units of gatherings and biblical books would have made it easier for the student to kind of shuffle the order of his notes before having them bound. However, not all um, biblical books had their separate choir structure. Two blocks in the middle of the codex um, contain multiple biblical books um, crossing choirs. So, and the only plausible explanation I've found for that is that these are very short apostolic letters for which the advantages of the gathering system just simply didn't outweigh their cost. Johannes Lulensis irregularly jotted down dates both next to the title of each commentary, uh, of some of the commentaries and in the scattered colophons at the end of biblical books, sometimes even on the half folios. Comparing these dates to the reconstruction that I've made of Bias's lecture cycles affirms that when there's a date uh, next to the title of the book, it usually points to the lecture date. Dates elsewhere, uh, like on the half folios, um, they point to the production of the notes. These latter uh, demonstrate that there could be quite some time actually between the actual lecture and the redaction of the text. For example, for the first letter in the codex, uh, that of Paul to the Romans, um, which was taught by Bias in 1568, Lumelensis writes, finished by me in the year um, 1571 in a note on the half folios. The year 1571 is also the year in which Bias finished expounding the final book contained in the manuscript, the Apocalypse. As this date is a recurring one in the colophons, it is highly likely that most of the final redaction work on these notes was done in 1571. Lumelensis then probably had the manuscript bound in 1571 after adding these half folios. After this, he started writing the references to the church fathers on the half leaves, and this is kind of corroborated by the abrupt end of these references in the middle of the manuscript, and the rest of these half leaves, they are empty, so, but they have been bound with the rest of the codex. Two days don't seem to conform with the hypothesis that Lumelensis bound his notes around 1571. The first date, 1573, is to be found in the letter of James in the second codicological like, composite block that is a composite of different biblical books, which I've called James A. It's especially perplexing uh, as firstly, Bias did not teach this letter in 1573. Three, and secondly, dates jotted down in the rest of this block point to lecture dates and a redaction process happening around 1570 or 1571. Moreover, two commentaries, two more commentaries on the letter of James have been bound after this uh, codicological block, one by, given by Michael Bais and another one given by Thomas Cornelius Petri. The inclusion of these two blocks, of course, um, breaks the order of the notes following the Vulgate as they are bound after uh, the letter, the, uh, after June, and thus they're in the wrong order. The most plausible explanation for this is the following. Luminensis decided to redact his note on the letter of James on separate gatherings. He did this to also include his notes on Cuneus Petri's lecture. The letter of James was at that time very crucial in uh, interconfessional polemics. For some reason, he also left some space in the large, larger codicological block, so here, in which he had originally planned to write down the notes on James. And then when he had the codex bound in 1571, the space was left blank. But the choir structure did not allow for these separate gatherings that he had made to be kind of squeezed into this larger codicological block. 
So he had it bound, he had them bound after that block, which ends with the second letter of, uh, with the, with the Jude, sorry. Um, then in 1573, he decided to fill in this original space that he had left blank with additional notes on James, perhaps from a different lecture. Although we could see this as a kind of um, screw up on the student part, student's part, it also shows how Johannes Lumelensis took great care in organizing these notes. Then the second colophon to post date the probable binding of the manuscript is written at the end of the manuscript. And it reads, um, I wrote this in Lille in 1575. The colophon concludes notes on a lecture given by Thomas Rosaius on Paul's letter to the Romans. And these notes were clearly written down after the codex had been completed because they, they start on the fly leaf at the beginning of the codex and then they continue on the last pages at the end. Interestingly, this note also offers a clue about the student's whereabouts in 1575. He was at that time residing in Lille and not in Leuven. So these second order notes were not produced during, during the lecture, but during a redaction process. In this process, the oral expanding of sacred scripture by the professor was captured onto the handwritten medium. The codicological analysis has demonstrated the mediatic constraints and opportunities of this physical carrier. Uh, and, but let us now look at the text itself. So interestingly, Lumelensis wrote down the lecture text in single columns of the same width throughout the years. So this way, when the edges of the final a text block were trimmed, the margins and the text surface would be uniformly centered. There are no inner margins, whereas the outer margins are quite broad. However, these outer margins were not intended to be written in when Lubelensis had his codex bound because he inserted the half folios between each full folio to note down these references to the church father that he made afterwards. Lumelensis, so Lumelensis clearly wanted a clean and easy to read text. This is also why he chose to write Cornelius Petris' uh, commentary on James in full on a separate gathering, ra rather than kind of inserting it into the margins of Bias's original lecture. The commentaries or the annotaciones on the biblical books given by Michael Bayus uh, are presented as a continuous text in which the fragments of the verses commented on are underlined. This layout is somewhat surprising as we would perhaps expect the biblical text to be presented in its entirety, like for example here, um, separate from the professor's glossage, which would then be visually keyed to the verses. Instead, Lumelensis wrote out a linear lecture text in which only those parts of the biblical verses were transcribed that Bias had commented on. These fragments were underlined. This has two impl important implications for how he redacted the oral lecture text into a written one. Um, firstly, this layout centers the lecture text by Michael Bias rather than the scriptural verses. Secondly, the style of notation kind of presupposes a good command of the scriptural text itself. The verses are incomplete. Only certain important words or phrases are transcribed. Moreover, um, Lugolensis seems to have written down variants to the Vulgate that I couldn't explain by differences between, for example, the Leuven Vulgate and the Duarens version. Um, and he, so he might have noted these down from memory and then making small mistakes against, for example, inflections and et cetera. Um, then paratextual elements, then uh, they're a prime example of how these handwritten notes make themselves independent from the orally delivered lecture. They allow the reader to navigate through the lecture text, freeing it from the chron chronological restrictions of the oral medium employed in the classroom. At the same time, there are a strategy to solve issues related to the handwritten lecture text itself, namely its uh, opacity and complexity. We can classify the underscoring of the scriptural verses and the Lubelensis inclusion of titles and header titles on each page as paratext. Uh, but most importantly, Lumenensis added a table of contents, which contains some additional information on Paul and signals of three commentaries on James and their location within the manuscripts. These paratextual elements are kind of the most visible interventions on the lecture text made by our student himself, 
independently from the oral auditive process of knowledge transmission in the lecture hall. And they kind of form an ideal segue into the final question of this presentation. Why did our students perform these intervention on the words other, uttered by his professor? Our student has identified himself as Johannes Lumelensis, a Vater Ordinis by the Gattorum. Moreover, the flyleaf of the codex contains a copy of a charter issue to the Dominican convent in Deuve. Thus, uh, Lumelensis must have studied at the Studium Generale of the Dominicans, the convent school that was incorporated into the University of Deuve. Its students could follow lectures and obtain grades at the Faculty of Theology, but simultaneous, simultaneously, the uh, convent school provided a separate uh, educational program to Dominican friars as well. The immatriculation roles of the university indeed show that Johannes Lumelensis um, was officially included in the university corporation on the 23rd of September, 1568, around the same time of the first date of a lecture in the manuscript. Our student, however, is not to be found in the examination roles of the Faculty of Theology. He did not seem to have taken any exams there. These lacunae make it um, difficult to uncover the student career of Lumalensis. We only have three pivotal dates, 1568, when um, he, was, he started his studies, 1571, when he presumably bound the manuscript, and then 1575, when he was in Lille. In fact, the Dominican convent in Lille was part of the Provincia Germania Inferior of the Dominican order to which Leuven also belonged. The Studium Generale of Leuven was the intellectual center of a veritable network of schools hosted by these convents in the province at which the brothers were prepared for their careers. Uh, three career trajectories stretched out for these young Dominican pupils, priesthood, preaching and teaching. Of those three, only the latter two required a study period at the Studium Generale in Leuven. Priesthood could be attained by studying at the Lesser um, Studia Solemnia. So we now know to what purpose Lumelensis was present in Michael Bayes' lectures. He knew that he would become either a preacher or a lector at one of the study houses of the convent. Lumelensis' absence in the accent exam roles of the faculty confirmed that he only officially partook in the educational program of the conventual school. The reason for this is to be found in the educational reforms made at the provincial chapter of the Dominicans in 1551. These were geared to weaponize the intellectual, intellectual sorry, activity of the Dominicans against the spread of Protestantism in the region. The brightest student were sent to were to be sent to the studium in Leuven, where they would be prepared for preaching or teaching. They were to follow courses given by their, their lector brothers and could apparently also attend lectures of the faculty without taking any exams there, however. After three years, they were obliged to leave Leuven for a different conflict, where the former students were to teach themselves philosophy or theology to the students at the local conventual school. After five years of teaching, they could submit a request to return to Leuven to actually start studying to obtain grades at the faculty. Um, this program aligns perfectly with the codicological analysis of Lumelens's manuscript. He started the three-year uh, study period at the studium in Leuven in 1568. He missed the lectures on the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles because a lecture cycle given by Michael Weiss took four and a half years and he was only there for three. In 1571, he had his notes bound and then left Leuven for the When teaching there, he added more notes and references to the um, half folios, which he finished in 1575. So my hypothesis is kind of as follows. Already at the start of his studies in 1568, Johannes Lubelensis knew that he would either become a preacher or a lecturer for his order. With this career already in mind, he started compiling his notes, which he finished in Lille in 1575 by adding references to the church fathers on the half photos, etc. Perhaps as a preparation for his lectures or sermons. So I contend that the student's foreknowledge of his career shaped to a great extent the materiality of the student notes. This foreknowledge was the result of those uh, educational reforms made by the provincial chapter of the Dominicans 
as it prescribed the student's trajectory. So the combined insights of the codicological, textual, and the historical approaches demonstrate that this codex is more than just the material remains of an oral auditive uh, process of knowledge transferring, transfer happening in the lecture hall. The lecture text has become independent from the lecture itself. It was created in the auditorium through the word spoken right by the professor, after which it was transcoded by the student onto the handwritten media. In doing so, Johannes Lumelensis manipulated the text towards his own goals, namely to apply his intellectual formation to the Dominican order's new battle against the spread of Protestantism in the province. This process of manipulation was indeed well thought out. Lumelensis took care to create uh, separate codicological blocks by matching choir structure with course content. Uh, he was already well versed in the biblical text, but wanted a neat expose of Bias's commentary on it easily navigable through the paratext. To this end, he interleaved the full biofolia with half biofolia before having the manuscript bound in 1571 at the end of his studies. This way, he avoided to clutter the margins when added, adding extra references and notes after 1571, perhaps in preparation for his lectureship uh, or his preaching in Lille. He finished writing down the references and adding extra notes there in 1575. So although Lumelensis employed these kind of conscious strategies to create his codex, he also clearly struggled with the constraints of anger. An example of this is the problem of adding these extra notes on the letter of James to the choir structure. However, it's exactly those struggles that point us to the intense handling of the lecture text by the student in his mind. The lecture of the professor had become a text in the mind of the student, and both the text and the physical carrier had to be manipulated toward the intellectual goal of the student. This goal was the weaponization of scholarly knowledge in a rapidly fragmenting confessional field by the Dominicans. So this codex is kind of the materialization of an active learning process of the student outside of the auditorium. And thus we can hardly call this a college dictat. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Um. Thank you, Yarik, for a wonderful three-layered analysis of, of this uh, very intriguing uh, document. Um, and also liked very much your uh, your phrase, the weaponization of, of knowledge. Uh, I guess there are plenty of questions about this this uh, struggle the student experienced with with the medium. There is one by Alexandra. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, Alex. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. And I have a question. It's partially um, informed by the discussion we had yesterday. So I'm going to pretend I didn't know what I, I don't know anything, and you're going to answer. So, have you found any other witnesses of uh, this lecture, and how do they differ from the one that you presented? Or um, if not for this precise lecture, how do other kinds of witnesses from of lectures from the classroom differ from this one? I mean, what are their uh, specificities? Thank you. Yeah, so I have one other um, notebook uh, of these lectures or overlapping le lectures made by uh, the nephew of Michael Bias, the professor, Jacques Debet. And actually, these notes are very different in terms of the way that the student um, has ordered them, et cetera. There's no uh, codicological blocks. The student doesn't really take the effort to start each commentary on a new page. He adds a lot of uh, material to the margins. He does add some um, small folios to add some extra notes, but he hasn't um, bound, so he hasn't had them bound into the codex, but he just glued them on. And I think these differences kind of are to be explained um, out of the background of the student because the other student, he, this guy, Johannes Lumelensis, he's, he's, um, he's a Dominican friar, so he's in a monastic context, whereas he, the other student, Jacobus Bias, he's a secular student and he had 
very different kind of worries when he was studying because he had to take exams to um, obtain his um, grades. So you see in these notes that he's clearly trying his first um, kind of concern isn't having a clean, easy to read lecture text, perhaps even out loud during his own lectures, but he really wants to have all of the information that he could get onto his physical carry, carrier because he has to take these exams. And I think that's a really interesting difference because it differs because it shows that kind of the intellectual goal of the student is almost as important as the lecture di dynamics in kind of shaping the material conditions of these student notes. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And then we have a question by Daniel Geert, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the, um, the talk. I really enjoyed that because um, I also work a little bit with, um, well, with student notes um, and especially with um, the education of future Protestant uh, pastors. And uh, it's interesting to see that also in your examples that it wasn't possible for the students always to hear the whole lecture. Um, it took four and a half years. We have examples of um, lectures from Luther on one book of the Bible for five years or 10 years. And that wasn't uncommon even until the end of this um, 16th century, I found many lectures that run seven, eight years. And that, and the students, especially those uh, who are training as pastors, they're only there for two or three years. That means it was never planned in the system that they could hear everything, but just a part of it. And that's, uh, I'm wondering how that works or my, my idea is that, um, a lot of the learning um, that the future pastors do is not at the public lecture level, but in private studies. And there are some, uh, a lot of indications on that. For example, all the, <clears throat> all the um, instructions that we have that have survived on, from Philip Melanchthon or others after him on how to study theology, <clears throat> none of them mention public lectures. It's all private study. Uh, curiously. So I'm thinking that uh, plays a large role in, um, in studying of theology, at least in the Protestant area. I'd be interested in it's also in the Catholic area. And maybe one more um, thing is also interesting for me to hear that in the, in the Catholic area, every book of the Bible was uh, interpreted. Um, in the Lutheran area, um, the books of like James and Jude and Revelations, they're almost never uh, discussed. It's just um, the most important books, according to the Lutheran view, like or Genesis, or Isaiah, but then the Romans, of course, and all the um, Pauline epistles, those are continually repeated as lectures, and then maybe for a year or two, one book, um, but not all the books of the Bible. Um, thank you for that comment. It's actually really interesting because um, before these uh, royal chairs, professors could choose. They taught for six weeks during the year and then they uh, rotated and they could choose which book they commented on for those weeks. But when Michael Weiss became a um, lecturer in sacred scripture, he actually decided to start um, doing these lecture cycles of four and a half years. But I've laid out the educational kind of path of this monastic student. But actually, really, what's really interesting is that for secular students, if you were to get your um, bacalaureus, you would actually, it, that would take exactly or around four and a half years. So actually, Michael Weiss did kind of um, make sure that his lecture, lecture cycles that a student who only obtained his baccalaureate would have heard every book of the New Testament in those four and a half years. And moreover, then the next four and a half years are the years preserved for your uh, licentiate if you wanted to get that. And so those four and a half years, you would actually hear the entire um, New Testament again. So I think this is kind of an, yeah, a, a really neat or interesting inter Invention on the educational program that Michael Weiss himself uh, kind of made, but uh, yeah, and I, for the second question, I kind of forgot what, um, for the second comment, what, what was a... Uh, oh, I'm not sure either. <laughs> I think it's maybe just more of a comment, uh, so. But yeah. it is a 
different the different I mean it is a really interesting difference that you that you've noticed here yeah yeah just the different books I think I talked about that some of the books were never discussed and, yeah. Yeah. just a comment thank you okay maybe one more question by David and then we have to move on yeah thank you I just wanted uh to say if I understood correctly you're arguing that the student notebook is therefore prepared looking forward to the degree that the student will be uh, aiming for in the future, right? Uh, what I was wondering is how that actually works in terms of the graduation exercises uh, that you have in, in Leuven, because the case in Bologna is that uh, very clearly the, the degree is based on disputations. Uh, you're given all of a sudden these questions to examine in public. And so what professors do there in private is to train their students with uh, questiones uh, constantly. And that doesn't quite seem to match with the format of the student notebooks, which are more of a, a lecture and, and comment. So can you say something about how, what the interaction between those uh, different kinds of approaches might be and how the approach in Leuven might be different? So in Leuven, there's a really interesting shift during the 16th century where um, in the first half, students as part of the exam would have to prepare their own commentaries uh, on uh, biblical books. And then around Michael Weiss's start of his lectureship, um, this changed. Now the issue is that um, the statutes of the faculty were updated in the 1560s, but they were lost in the fire of um, the Library of Leuven, so we can't really reconstruct it. But um, uh, I think, so they definitely had to do the um, disputations, uh, but I think they also had to, um, by the end of the 16th century, they definitely had to take an exam just based on scripture, which, and it was just prescribed as an exam, but we don't know if this was the case in the 1560s as well, but I think um, the requirement might have been that they showed these um, notes or their commentaries to the teacher, but um, yeah, I'm still kind of trying to figure all of that out, and it's really frustrating that we don't yeah. have those updated statutes, but... <laughs> Yeah, but then again, the statutes may not have been followed, so maybe it's not not a huge loss anyway. Uh, at least not in Bologna. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs>